Our New Testament scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapters 15, verses 6 through 21. It's got two very familiar characters, uh, Paul and Barnabas, and they've been out and about with the apostles and sometimes greeted and treated well and other times not. So this is part of their story. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. Um, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testify to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably upon the Gentiles to take from them among a people for his, for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophet as it, as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins, I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain, to abstain only from the things polluted by idols, and from fornication, and from whatever has been strangled, and from blood. For in every city, for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. This is the word of God for all God's people. Do you see cat? I, I have a story about a cat. When uh, the spiritual teacher and his disciples <clears throat> began his, their evening meditation, the cat who lived in the monastery made such noise that it distracted them. So the teacher ordered that the cat be tied up during the evening practice. Years later, when the teacher died, the cat continued to be tied up during the meditation session. And when the cat eventually died, another cat was brought to the monastery and tied up. When that cat died, another cat was brought to the monastery and tied up. And the uh, repetition was going on and on and on. Centuries later, no one knows what they, why they had to tie up a cat during the meditation session, but they still did. And yet, learned uh, descendants of the spiritual teacher wrote scholarly dissertations about the religious significance 
of tying up a cat for meditation practice. Well, it has happened all over the places over so many years. So people reacted to this story. It's amazing how people don't question authority or tradition. People don't think about what they are doing. They just do it because it's always been done that way, or because everyone else is doing it. Kind of scary. So the tradition, tradition is a very important source for us to use when we are trying to find the right way for us in confused times. So that is why tradition is one of the four that I showed you uh, earlier with young disciples that uh, John Wesley uh, and Methodist ancestors uh, used all the time when they needed to find uh, out what would be the best and God's will for them in those confused times. So, like you already saw, we call this a Wesleyan quadrilateral, right? Okay, West, can you say Wesleyan quadrilateral? So this is how we discern God's will as a Methodist. I don't know about other uh, denominations. But we do this, so we take scripture and tradition, experience and reason very seriously. Um, scripture is considered the primary source and standard for Christian doctrine. Some people emphasize only scripture. So sola scripture is a big motto for some denominations. But uh, for us, scripture is the primary source, but it is at the same time one of the four essential uh, sources. And tradition is our experience and our witness of development and growth of the faith through the past centuries. And experience is uh, the individual's understanding and appropriating uh, of the faith in the light of his or her own life. So experience is very important to, to ask, to raise a question uh, about traditions that no one knows why they're doing, right? People feel weird, and this is not right, and then you raise question. And we have reason. Through reason, the individual Christian brings to bear on the Christian faith, discerning and cogent thought. For this reason, we learn from science and anthropology, psychology, and all other disciplines. So we, um, we make a better decision when we are better informed. So these four elements uh, taken together bring the individual or the uh, communal uh, Christian community to a mutual and fulfilling understanding of the Christian faith and the required response of worship and service and how to live, how to follow uh, Jesus' way in our daily lives. So how much have you used each element here? Scripture, how often do you read the scripture to find out whether you are taking the, uh, making the right choice 
uh, to decide or to see whether your church is making the right decision or not. How importantly do you take your experience and your communal experience as the tool to teach us and uh, direct us to the right question, to the right direction, so that we can be awakened for this long sleep under this long tradition. And how often do you refer to tradition? Uh, how well do you know about your tradition? How often do you ask about your, uh, I mean, ask your grandparents, great grandparents, or uh, longest member of the church about what's going on uh, about some issues? And how often and how seriously are, are we using reason and science to find out what is really going on, what we should do in this situation. So this is so important. Uh, so I, uh, it was very challenging for me to talk about this with young disciples, but I want them to know <laughs> that this is so important, somehow they uh, can remember you know, anything from here. So, oh, I should ask somebody, or I should uh, read some books uh, before they you know, make uh, any decision. So for us, for our United Methodist Church, I know we are ecumenical community, uh, truly, but uh, our church is United Methodist Church, so I'm talking about United Methodist Church, our tradition. Um, our tradition uh, can be represented uh, uh, with this book of discipline. Uh, so every four year at general conference, uh, people, all the delegates from all over the world they uh, discuss and uh, make resolution and pass the resolution and all the recommendations. And then after a general conference, uh, the publishing house get busy, so they publish new book of discipline every four years. It tells us what we have been doing as a denomination, as a uh, Christian community, uh, uh, how to use our resources and how to think how to uh, do whatever we are doing. So you, you will be surprised uh, what kind of things is there. <laughs> so I think we should have more discipline, book of discipline, so that you may get some, uh, you know, uh, take a look at, you may take a look at them. Our denomination uh, was born as a United Methodist Church, uh, 1968. Before that, uh, over uh, more than 200 years, uh, we had our history, but uh, as a United Methodist Church was born uh, as a united uh, body in 1968. And then uh, the following general conference, uh, people uh, wanted to have a social updated social principles uh, about uh, how we do whatever we do. And, um, and uh, the, our uh, United Methodist Church uh, made an official declaration regarding uh, homosexuality in uh, the General Conference, 1972. So the or original resolution had just no negative uh, tone or anything there. It said homosexuals, no less than het het heterosexuals, 
are persons of sacred worth, worth who need the ministry and guidance of the church in their struggles for human fulfillment, as well as the spiritual and emotional care of a fellowship which enables reconciling relationships with God, with others, and with the self. Further, we insist that all persons are entitled to have their human and civil rights ensured. So that was the original resolution. And this statement was initially uh, approved by the Legis Legislative Committee. Um, our Linda and Don knows what that is. We have small uh, groups. You go there and you discuss and then you uh, vote. And so it was passed in that legis legislative uh, committee, but it was met with great opposition when presented at a plenary session of general conference. So it was 1972. The debate on the conference floor was heated and intense. And finally, a lay delegate proposed an amendment to the statement that was approved by the entire body. So the added part is like that, like this. Further, we insist that all persons are entitled to have their human and civil rights ensured, though we do not condone the practice of homosexuality and consider this practice incom incompatible with Christian teaching. And um, in almost every uh, following general conference, negative comments and uh, further restrictions were added. So in 1976, uh, any form of financial aid to gay caucus and group was prohibited and no ordination was allowed uh, in the statement in 1984. And we still has it, Par paragraph 304.3, the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Therefore, self-avowed practicing Homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates, ordained as ministers, or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. So this has been the tradition of United Methodist Church for the last 46 years. But over, over the last 46 years, a lot of uh, our lives have changed. Uh, our experiences have been so um, growing um, with um, our brothers and sisters, with LGBTQ uh, community. And uh, so, but at the same time, um, because of this tradition, because of this law, church law, a lot of clergy members have lost their credentials because they performed the same-sex marriage or they have uh, come out as gay or lesbian ordained uh, pastors. And more importantly, thousands of thousands of um, United Methodist LGBT uh, disciples have been uh, discouraged and oppressed and excluded from the full life of uh, United Methodist Church. Because of uh, uh, so much enriched uh, experience uh, with our brothers and sisters from LGBTQ uh, community, many, many uh, churches and um, clergy members 
and lay members uh, have protested against this paragraph uh, over the half century, uh, last half century. And nowadays, in some uh, places, we just uh, do it. Uh, we accept everybody equally, and we uh, not just baptize, we just ordain them, and we, let, we appointed them, and we now have a uh, bishop, uh, openly gay uh, bishop uh, presiding in uh, a conference, uh, our neighboring conference. So, the four elements, it is so important. And um, one thing more, the science has helped us to understand what's going on, really. And that's another, uh, that's going to be another uh, sermon or some uh, Bible study time that I can talk about that. <laughs> Jesus uh, challenged Jewish traditions that restricted uh, so many people on so many aspects of their lives, especially any work or even good work being done on Sabbath day. Uh, it was restricted so extreme way. The Bible said, keep your Sabbath day holy, but it does not say you should not kill the bent over woman for 18 years on Sabbath day. The tradition was telling them not to do it. The tradition was the Jewish understanding or interpretation of the Bible was telling people not to heal anyone who is sick on Sabbath day. And the Bible does say a lot of things, but people made up so many different traditions out of it so that people could not uh, follow up. Uh, nobody could fulfill the completion of all those laws and uh, traditions. So Jesus challenged them to restore the original purpose of the law, which was to lift up the spirit of people by assisting people to be able to love God and love their neighbors. So he healed so many sick people on Sabbath day, and he forgave someone else's sin, even though it was, uh, even though uh, the tradition said only God forgave sins. And Jesus allowed his disciples to eat from the field, even though it was Sabbath. And he said, the Sabbath was made for humankind. Have some common sense. That's not what Jesus said. That's what I'm saying. But <laughs> the, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. That's what Jesus said. Jesus was teaching them and us that the law and the tradition about how to use the law, all those things should serve human needs and not to take away the right to preserve human life. So before Jesus' time, the law was God for Jewish people the people of God. And their tradition was their idol that they worshipped more than the living God. But after Jesus' time, 
things were changed. So I want to look at Jerusalem Council today according to today's Bible uh, text in Acts chapter 15, 6 through 21. It was AD 50. Peter, the top leader of the first Christian church, tried to convince Jewish Christians to accept the new reality of God's family, where all people in the world could become equal children of God. What a different world now. Gentiles like us did not have to need, did not need to become Jews first in order to become children of God. We did not need to fulfill all the Jewish laws and traditions. So this reality was not easy at all for any Jewish Christians to accept. And Peter had the hardest time to accept this new reality in the beginning. You know, the law was their life. The law was their identity, the law and their, their traditions were their purpose and their safeguard. Did you know that uh, there are 613 commandments and laws in the Old Testament? And out of 613, uh, there are 365 negative commandments. Okay, thou shalt not make idols for yourself, something like that. And this number, 365 co coincides with the number of days in solar calendar. And they also had 248 positive commandments, like honor your mother and father. And this number coincides with the number of bones and main organs in human body. Total 613 commandments, the law, the commandments, the tradition in the Bible were their blood and their life. How could they disregard all these things? How could they? But God was able to change their heart because it was God. Who did that? So God changed Peter's mind, as, we, as you know. He was praying, and he had this uh, vision three times. This basket uh, full of unclean animals came coming down from heaven, and the voice said to him, eat these animals. Nobody can say they are unclean because I made them. It happened three times. And he knew that. He knew that. It was the voice of God. And it was Peter. Peter. And he, how could he reject the voice of God? But do you know what he did? He rejected the voice of God even after three times of visions. It was that hard. It was unthinkable for him to eat those animals. They, he knew that he would die if he ate those animals. So then, after that, the Holy Spirit started working on his heart. Holy Spirit helped him to open his heart and mind and guided him to meet Cor Cornelius, a Gentile, and his family. So Peter visited them and he just proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. And what happened? They all accepted the good news of Jesus Christ. And they were so happy, overjoyed for the salvation they were receiving. And the Holy Spirit, Spirit was pouring upon all those people. They were speaking tongues and 
they were say, showing all, all the signs of receiving the Holy Spirit with his own eyes. Peter saw that and he could not reject the work of the Holy Spirit. So he was changed. And then at uh, the Jerusalem Council, he said to all these brothers, in cleansing Gentiles' hearts by faith, only by faith, God has made no distinction between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. Peter finally agreed at Jerusalem Council with the Saint Paul who report, made so many reports about the same incident with the Gentiles all over the places. And Peter continued to say, listen, now therefore why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. Why do you want to put this yoke of the law, old law, on their neck? We have not been able to bear that. Let's not do it. In this process of discovering the will of God, Peter's experience played a crucial role. Paul's experience played a crucial role. They didn't just refer to the scripture or their traditions, but they referred to the third component of Wesleyan quadrilateral experience and their reasoning. Let us think about it. Let us share our experience. What's going on? But right after, James stood up and said, he agreed with Peter, but do you, do you know what he did? He added an amendment. And he said, but, we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols. At the time, almost all the food in the market came from the temple. That means all food in the market were polluted by idols. Number two, from fornication. Sexual intercourse between people not married to each other. Number three, from whatever has been strangled. And number four, from blood. Then the amendment was passed. History repeats itself in our United Methodist Church history. Once the first amendment was accepted, the second and the third and the fourth amendments might have followed. But thankfully, as we know, after this Jerusalem Council in AD 50, the amendment seemed to disappear. St. Paul proclaimed the pure gospel of Jesus Christ in his letter to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, 29. There is no longer Jews or Greek there is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So Paul, St. Paul said, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. It is wrong for anyone to add amendments to the true gospel of Jesus Christ in order to exclude 
and oppress others. Amen? Amen. And especially those who have received the Holy Spirit and become the children of God. The first Gentile Christians did not have to become a Jew in order to join the family of God. Likewise, anyone in Christ Jesus is a reconciled, free, and fully worthy to be a child of God now and forever. Amen. Amen. So let us not place on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. Let us not submit again to a yoke of slavery since Christ has set us free for freedom. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, thank you for the freedom. Thank you for the courage to stand up for what we believe in with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to courageously spread this gospel with all the people in the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen.